incredibly important to how we operate. Because how do we be found by her? She's not going to come to us. We've got to be out there in the conversation. And if we put ourselves behind a wall again, we won't be in the conversation. We won't be found. She won't hear us. She won't care about us. She won't come to us. So how do we get out there? Now, the Guardian, for whom I write and, and, and uh, consult, full disclosure, has decided that rather than putting everything behind a wall, they're going to do the opposite. They've created an API for all their content. They've, they've, they put up, by the way, full text RSS feeds, and they found their traffic still went up. And now they have the API where I could come along, well, I'm not a good programmer, but my son could come along, and he could create an application using the Guardian's content. They have conditions. You have to get their permission. You have to refresh the content every 24 hours because of libel laws in the UK. You have to uh, link to them and give them credit. And you have to join their ad network. But not a bad deal. You get free content and a little money. And the Guardian gets spread. It is distributed. It is in the fabric of the web. So as we th rethink how we create news, it almost makes me think that if you started a news site today, you shouldn't start a site at all. You should create something that is out there of the web. I teach a course here on entrepreneurial journalism. and. Um, uh, in the first term, one of the students had an idea about a, a, a magazine for young women, uh, like a sassy brought to online. And uh, uh, Jim Kennedy from the AP heard all the ideas, and at the end he said, well, these are okay, guys, but they're all websites. I thought you were going to be beyond that. You know, aren't you cool? And this, this made the students say, oh, of course, it should be Facebook. It should be where the people are, where the young people are. So how do we think to be where the people are? Uh, Uh, the notion to, well, one way I look at this is, now, is our brand still of value? Yes, but the value changes. If the brand is a magnet, if it says you have to come to us, that's our assumption is you'll always come to our brand, that's not working as well anymore. It, it, I'm not saying it goes away. But when you discover content and discover information out there on the web through the conversations, the brand has incredible value as a label. Right. It does bring value in saying, I, I know them. Yes, I know what they do. I know their standards. I know who they are. I know the work they go to. I know where I can go to them and find out what's what. That provenance is incredibly important. I just blogged before I came down, downstairs um, that the AP and some organization in the UK I'd never heard of, whose name I can't remember, uh, are trying to start a metadata standard for news. And they're doing it in a fairly standard way of starting off with rights and, uh, and all that. But I think if you think about the provenance of news and where information came from, the more we use links to footnote our articles, to show our sources, to show our work to be transparent, the more our work has credibility, especially in this world where it's all distributed. Uh, this looks like a really bad Petri dish experiment. Uh, but it's a chart that I got about a year and a half ago out of, the, out of a PowerPoint done by uh, Samir Arora, who is the uh, CEO of Glam. Anybody in here know Glam? More of you should. Glam uh, is the leading women's brand online. Uh, iVillage was the queen of online. It has 20 million unique users. Glam, in three years, grew to 110 million unique users. It did that by thinking in the network model. iVillage owns, creates, or licenses content and controls that content. Glam created instead a network of, I think, now 800 sites. And it does not own them. Instead, it brings them value. It sells ads for them. It takes the best of their content and puts it in sells ads there too and shares that revenue. It gives them technology. It gives them promotion. And because of creating a network, it grew to be five times larger than iVillage with much less cost in much less time. iVillage is as old as the, as the browser. So how do we in news organizations think this same way and create networks? We're working here at CUNY on the new business models for news project, where we're trying to flesh out business models for the future and let's face the devil head on. The last metro paper in a city dies, what replaces it? We think an ecosystem of many players operating under many different motives and models. And the way this is going to operate has to be, I think, a network. It has to be the idea that people will work together and collaboratively with shared value. Um, but the network economics are also different. In the Fortune magazine, uh, Forbes magazine started a blog ad network, yay for them. But they took 50% of the ad revenue. No, bad for you. And, and I said, I'm not going to join. You're taking too much. The less you take, the bigger you will grow. 
the bigger you will grow, the more you have something. So look at the economics of Craigslist. Um, uh, Craig's a friend. He's come here to the school to talk. And he befuddles everyone in our industry, of course. And they say, you destroyed revenue in our industry. Well, he didn't destroy anything. He saw the opportunity to create something online to serve people directly. The internet put people together directly. Um, I looked at the, at the figures on classified revenue from 2000, which was the height. It's declined by $10 billion a year. Craig makes an estimated, estimated, no, he, no, he doesn't say, but estimated $100 million a year with 28 employees. Craig has a hell of a nice business, right? Craig doesn't care that he could, you know, in our old view, you could have had 10 billion. <laughs> now, indeed, Craig was asked in this room by students who said, well, you care about philanthropy and, and preserving journalism. Why don't you charge more so you can increase your value and then sell it for billions of dollars and then use that money in philanthropy? And Craig's view was no. I'm leaving this money in the pockets of the people out there in the, in, in the marketplace. He, yes, it's not in the pockets of the middlemen anymore, i.e. newspapers, but newspapers have never had a right to that revenue. It was just a convenient factor that they controlled the marketplace because they controlled the press. The economics of this changed fundamentally. When I came through J School, we did not learn the economics of the business at all. We were told to stay away from business. It was dirty. We have to learn this now. 